been available for Tord's accomplishments, but William has plenty of his own as well, has an OCIC top four, where Tord was OCIC champion, in fact. Yeah, and, and I think the when you've got a list of accomplishments that end with champion, the fact you're able to get to the end of any tournament is an accomplishment in itself. And they'll both be looking to add this tournament to that list as we begin shortly here at EUIC. It's been a great event so far. The biggest event we've had outside of Japan ever. And it's now a chance to see who's going to be crowned at the top of that tournament. But first, they have one hurdle before that final. Both players now set up. Action Pokemon set down now. What's really cool is actually seeing both of these players actually utilizing that Buddy Buddy Poffin to try and grab the Clefers as well to draw up and not really allow the Borse to have a very susceptible Groton V as we do get a chance to glance at the prize here for both players. Okay, I mean, nothing too crazy there. I think the, the technical machine devolution might be surprising to some of you, thinking, well, that's really important, but there is two of them in the list. Yeah, both of these players would have been thinking about playing the Charizard EX mirror match. So a number of different ways to handle that in both of these lists. Williams, though, combining Eri alongside maybe some of those TM devolutions could be really impactful this matchup. And that's where those Charmeleons and how they're utilized will be key. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. The TCG Masters Top 4 is kicking off with William, it looks like, who will be starting us off here with both players having unique Pokemon in the active spots here. That Bidoof for Tord's side, he's combined both the Barrel and the Pidgeot engines in his list. Yeah, and one of the big susceptible factors in the Pidgeot EX version of Charizard was if it gets knocked out, you're then stuck stranded with no engine, no ability to get the cards you want. But if you've got a Bibarel and the Pidgeot in play, it works out very nicely. And another thing we've noticed with the Charizard Pidgeot deck is they often get quite low hand sizes. And so if you have that Bibarel to work alongside your cards we we're just mentioning there, the Pidgeot EX searching for exactly what you need, you can start drawing through your deck and finding more options, uh, and that's where your Pidgeot X can find combo pieces rather than relying on just finding that one card you need at any given moment. Yeah, big opening turn for William here, simply because he'll be able to go first, has the opportunity to evolve up ahead of Tord, of course. Does find the Rotom V from that Ultra Ball there with the Forest Seal Stone already in hand, quickly pops off that Star Alchemy just to grab that Buddy Buddy Poffin. Further Charmander and Pidgey hits the field here. Great start to his turn one in this top four. Yeah, Rotom V will also be able to instant charge at the end of this first turn and get more cards, but setting up nice and wide, setting up as stable as possible, a great place to start, especially as we mentioned, the style of deck that William is playing here, very much designed to take away those rare candies and make it Near impossible for Tord to set up a Charizard. Yeah, no instant charge there. Tord, over to you for your first turn. I think get a, gl a glimpse of William's hand as well. That Eri is waiting in the wings right now. And when there's item cards that can't be played on your first turn, like that rare candy, could start to really, really cause some problems. And that prime catcher. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yes, indeed. Back to that argument, shall we? <laughs> I think we've moved on from <laughs> Eri and Prime Catcher now, but it is one of the greatest targets. Uh, a one-of in the deck, a very powerful one-of, and if Eri can get rid of it, takes away one of those powerful turns that is possible with the Prime Catcher. So Tor just now going to be checking those prize cards, using an Ultra Ball to get rid of the Radiant Charizard and another Ultra Ball. And we'll be looking to also set up nice and wide. It is key in this matchup, as you can potentially start chaining Charizards when they've not been knocked out. And that's another thing that's very interesting here and very unique to this matchup is that Tord has those two Professor Turo scenarios. And so consequently might be able to heal damage out of play and reduce that opportunity for a two hit knockout for William. Yeah, the Minion V has hit the board to grab that Arvin to pull out an item card and a tool card, has selected the Buddy Buddy Poffin alongside that Forest Seal Stone, as we do see 
the first Pidgey and Charmander hit towards board as well. Just sort of, again, double checking those prizes there. Forest Seal Stone, just also an option to grab another Buddy Buddy Poffin that he's been lining up. It looks like that Cleffa is going to be coming into play. I mean, the Cleffa featuring in both their lists, a card that I don't think is very common at this event in a Charizard list, but they're, they're both having a chuckle about it, as I'm sure it's been very useful throughout the tournament. But for those of you who don't know what Cleffa does, it's a great way to set up at the start. Yep, Cleffa, just 30 HP, Psychic-type Pokemon, Grasping Draw able to do so without any energy attachments, but allows you to draw cards until you have seven in your hand. Fantastic little utility card, only a single prizer that you'd be giving up as well. Just needs the energy attachment maybe, or that prime catcher utilized nice and early to get that Cleffer into the active spot. And now could just grasping draw up to the seven. And that Rotom V is now unfortunately in the active spot. Yeah, and, and using that Prime Catcher early to add a bit of disruption in. Uh, also gets rid of a card from the hand, so the Grasping Draw digs deeper. But it also is uh, just playing around that Eerie. You don't want to hold it for too long and then end up losing it down the line. Uh, but having that Rotom V in the active just forces another resource, another energy uh, out of William. Yeah, really big. Because, of course, William will be looking to try and set up the board state first. Try and get those Pidgeot EX down before sort of comboing into the Charizard EX. And sometimes you can't do that without a supporter, but has played the Eri down. Hand knowledge here. Super Rod and Ultra Ball, the only two targets available. Oh, wow. And I think there was a Super Rod prized for Tord, if I remember correctly. It, might, it could have been either side. I can't remember which player had one prize, but still to remove a Super Rod from play and that Ultra Ball, that's now three Ultra Ball gone, and that might make this next turn a little bit tougher to set up. With that, with that Radiant Charizard also sitting in the discard pile following that Ultra Ball that Tord played to grab the Luminium V. But yes, we got that great glimpse into that Super Rod there, and it, I believe it was just an instant charge from William, so a bit of a slow turn, but Tord knows that he's just powered up his hands with three additional cards. Iono instantly played off the energy attachment to that Charmander there as well. Yeah, there is a pal pad in Williams list, so another Eerie could be played later on. But for now, Tord will feel a little bit safer holding on to some item cards. Does get the rare candy. And just oh. going to struggle to get anything going here. Yeah, but that Ultra Ball does remove the Luminion from play. Great option there. Choice Belt, just attachment to one of the Charmanders. Just will be using that Grasping Draw once again. Another cute little thing of that Cleffer is that it has free retreat, so can pivot around when Tord needs to do so, especially when he doesn't have that Pidgeot EX in play yet. Yeah, and if it survives multiple turns, can really help you set up. You can knock out that Cleffer with a heat tackle on the Charmander. That's something to bear in mind. But uh, Cleffer is great into these matchups where your opponent can only take one knockout per turn. Because right? you'd rather give up the Cleffer each turn than anything else. And like you said, it's that free retreater that can allow you to pivot throughout the game especially when we, we look at Tord's list, it's got a lot of Professor Turo scenarios in it. So having a free retreater on board that you can put up into the active and retreat into the next uh, attacker can be very useful. Yeah, what's going to be key here between these two players who are, of course, playing a very similar archetype with sort of cute techs in their decks, as we do see the Ultra Ball for that Pidgeot EX there. Both are playing, as we've already, already mentioned, Two different ace specs. We've already seen towards Prime Catcher. William, we've seen on stream before, utilize that maximum belt. Yeah, and, and across the board, we've seen ace specs of varying uh, distributions that we thought, compared to what we thought. And I think maximum belt was the expected card in Charizard. But how many of these Charizard lists at EUIC were playing maximum belt and Prime Catcher? Yeah, following a lot of sort of the online results and Wherever we can get information from, people testing it. I mean, over two thirds of the actual player base of Charizard EX players were actually playing Maximum Belt in comparison, just around, just over the 100 odds that were actually playing Prime Catcher. So, some little insight there in terms of some of the I don't know, some special plays that people are making with Charizard by utilizing Prime Catcher instead, taking maybe prizes on the bench rather than necessarily the active. Yeah, and uh, I think the TM Devolution was something that was popularized pre-rotation as a Charizard mirror tech. It also useful in some other matchups, but 
so, so powerful at devolving those Charizards. And as is typical of the Charizard mirror, no matter which rotation you played it in, no matter whether it's these lists or not, whoever takes that first knockout isn't necessarily going ahead. Yeah, for sure. Remember, currently the damage as a base is 180 damage of the Charizard EX. Of course, does begin to ramp up as your opponent begins to take further prizes. We do see the Pidgeot EX utilizing that quick search to help William get into the first Charizard EX of this Masters Top 4. We'll be swinging away with that fantastic Burning Darkness attack. Infernal Rain helps to accelerate the energy from the deck as well, choosing or allowing you to choose three basic Fire Energy cards and attach them to your Pokemon in any way you like. And previously, the TMD Evolution was a way to spread damage out across the board and then devolve everything at the same time. Um, whereas when you've got two TMD Evolutions, you can uh, sort of use it as a way to disrupt the rare candy resources. Our first knockout there from William, going to be taking a single prize of that Cleffer has been knocked out. It got its use twice, so definitely grasping draw through the game will definitely help later on as many more cards will be seen for Tord as the Rotom V comes down. Uh, the Luminium V was removed from play earlier, but having a Rotom V in play is still great, especially when you start struggling or you get disrupted, having that instant charge on board can be very useful. Yeah, it does mean it's giving a bit of a tell that a hand maybe is not as strong as he would have liked, bit, or just kind of trying to get particular cards out of the deck. Hits a rare candy. Is there a Charizard EX in hand? I think so. So that might be an opportunity now to start attacking, but I'm sure Tord is aware of some of the cards in his opponent's list and will be thinking, every time I use a rare candy, that could be a, a chance for disruption in the future. That could be a chance for the TM devolution to be used. And again, that's where we spoke about having that Barrel line and the Pidgeot line. Tord doesn't need to rely on the Pidgeot EX and using more rare candies for that, can instead save them for the Charizards uh, as they've got the Barrel as a backup. Yeah, big pickup from the boss's orders to take out the Rotom V as well still keeps the Charizard EX out of range from a return KO and only other single prizes. Actually, did bench the Rotom V, I apologize. But it's a big knockout to just kind of take initiative in this matchup, in this mirror. As you've mentioned, it doesn't necessarily mean you're that far ahead because of the ramping up of the damage of the Burning Darkness here. But a nice, easy two prizes here for Tord Reckler. Yeah, and that. Charmeleon we see on the bench for William is a great way to evolve up and also can stay in play and be immune from that TM devolution. Yeah, in the same way that we heard from Vinny all the way back in day one that you can replace something like um, the Prime Catcher or necessarily even the other tool card and maximum belt to increase damage. Tord is playing sort of the counter catchers, playing choice belts, playing that defiance belt on the active Charizard EX as well. So if William ever decides to try and target down that Rotom V, maybe a bit of a bait, but it does activate that defiance band and can actually stretch over the Pidgeot EX HP. Exactly, yeah. So it would be doing 270 with the Burning Darkness plus 30 from defiance band. So the Rotom V almost like a bait here from yeah. Tord. Like, go on, take it out. I'll take your Pidgeot EX straight after. Does have that boss's orders in hand, but let's see how William will play out this turn. Quick search utilized here. Another Charmander has hit the board as well. That Charmeleon was evolved up on the previous turn. So this is vital to just be able to know how best to chain your attackers. Charizard EX was the target here. Into the hands, evolving up with the Charmeleon. Another Infernal Rain coming down now. One energy from the deck, has another Fire Energy in hand as well. What's the direction you take here if you're William? Well, you know, the strategy around that TM Devolution is definitely something that's got to be done well. With one of them in the prizes, you won't necessarily be able to chain them. Tord has very carefully used those rare candies as resources, but now just getting that counter catcher for future turns and the maximum belt revealing the ace spec. Yeah, that counter catcher potentially for this turn is act is oh, it's and can be now. activated. It's live because it's only taken one prize compared to towards two. But What's he gonna go for? <laughs> the barrel it's, maybe? It is the barrel just kind of again initiating so that both players will go down to four prizes here. 
not allowing Tor to utilize his own counter catcher. Almost saying I ne you need to put a Pidgeot EX in play, otherwise you're going to be relying on your top deck. And that's asking quite a lot of Tor now that the barrel is gone. And that puts the prize cards even. As you mentioned, that Pidgeot EX would have been in range if the Rotom V had been knocked out. But now they are level and both Charizards will be outputting 240 damage without the tool cards. Yeah, really unique lines of play here. I really... I'm just looking forward to see how this game actually ends up right at the end. But we've got to get through this sort of mid-phase first. That Professor Truer's scenario instantly played on that Rotom. That bait was enough. Wasn't, wasn't actually taken by William. And now just an attack is even. So just 60 additional damage. 240 damage being placed onto that Charizard EX. Yeah, and Tord making his way through a Snorlax stall deck just beforehand. And that was thanks to Professor Tiro's scenario. Plays two of them and the team yells cheer to be able to recycle two of them. So he can use that effect four times per game, which is enough to be able to take out a Snorlax deck. So uh, a clever inclusion and a few supporter cards to allow you to have a better matchup into Snorlax. But now has to try and work out the mirror. The most expected deck for anyone right now is playing against Charizard EX, even if you are a Charizard EX deck yourself. Yes. It's a strange back and forth here. You could say Tord's in the advantageous position because he's got the damage onto William's Charizard EX. Or you could say William's in the advantageous position because he has double Charizard EX and the Pidgeot in play. But it all comes down to how both players will navigate these turns here as both players are only really taking knockouts on those single prizes unless you give up one of those smaller HP Pokemon V. And you have got the Professor Turo scenario on both sides to reset the damage on the Charizard EX, which could be an interesting chain of activities to not put yourself in range of knockout for Charizard EX, but start sprinkling damage down to get yourself ahead, like you said, in, in the damage on board. Yeah, I think William's just kind of prepping future turns here. May consider just maybe chipping away at towards side of the board does choose to target down that Charmander, remove any future Charizard EXs for the moment as well. Again, doesn't really impact too much here. We do push that Pidgeot into range with that Defiance Belt now live, but has to hit those cards first. Hits the Charmeleon that turn as well. Looks like an Arvin's the only supporter that's in hand right now. And if Tor so takes this knockout on the Charizard EX, he'll go down to two prize cards remaining, and that would mean that he would uh, be in range of Maximum Belt, which was the card, the Ace Spec card we saw William have in the hand. So as you, you're looking out there, that hand for Tord, despite not having any Barbaro or having a Pidgeot EX in play, has got some really good cards there. Yeah, that Roxanne is in the hand right now, but for the time being, if he's not able to also maybe impact William's side with maybe a Pidgeot EX knockout, you're just kind of having to hope you find that custom, ca uh, not custom catcher, counter catcher um, that would have been available um, because of being one prize remain, well, one prize further remaining than William. Yeah, maybe that'll be next turn's plan, just using the Arvin here to prep it. But then William might look to disrupt the hand. It's a interesting spot to navigate. The Charizard mirror has always been fascinating as to how each player takes it on. It's never obvious who's going to be going ahead. Sometimes the player who takes the first knockout loses. Sometimes the player who takes the first knockout wins. Sometimes disruption sticks. Sometimes we, we see the Pidgeot EX knockout be the start of the end for one of the players. A lot right now riding on these turns and toward opting to try and stabilize the board and have more options down the line. He's being very careful with his rare candies as he knows the devolutions are opposing him. So just trying to set up a way to be able to get the knockout next turn should William take this Charizard. Yeah, some vital turns here. Tord could attack into this Charizard EX in the active spot, take two further prizes, two remaining. Kind of a couple of big turns here. Just deciding how best to navigate this position. Oh, just taking the knockout there. We could have very easily seen a pass as taking that knockout does initiate a powerful position now for William as with that Charizard EX on the bench and a maximum belt, 
we will see a return knockout earlier than was previously possible before the rotation. Yeah, we know it was grabbed via that oven a couple of turns ago. Remember, four prizes taken here by Tor does mean that Burning Darkness is ramped up 120 more damage. So 300 damage it's doing at this stage of the game. Well, this is, this is the point where you wonder what William has planned. I think we're, we're getting to a stage now where the TM devolution strategies aforementioned will not be possible, uh, as it would be a too slower method, potentially. And we'll look to potentially try and get a knockout on the active with a bit of disruption toward no Pidgeot EX on board, no Bibarel on board. Something like a Roxanne or an Iono would put him down to very few cards. So does William trust in the Roxanne? He goes for it. And we're going to be seeing what Tord can draw off of his two cards as William will be taking a knockout on that active Charizard EX. Nothing in play for Tord to return the knockout. All off of this disruption now for Tord. Yeah, that massive attachment of that tool is there. Still has Quick Search live as well. Typically tilts the cards when it has been utilized, but this Roxanne big, especially when Tord has no way out of it currently. Anyway. This was exactly why Tord was considering not attacking last turn. You could see him taking a moment to work it out because this is exactly the scenario he was, he was worried about. You know, two cards, two random cards from his deck. I don't even know if he's had a look at them yet. Doesn't want to no. give away anything. No, he hasn't. Just keep that, keep that poker face away from William watching you as we do see the quick, uh, quick search ability now. A couple of different options. Could Already. even prep for next turn just in case. Just grabs that fire energy. He looks like second guessing himself. Remember, it's really tense. This is Masters top four after all. Game one. Both players down to just two prizes and three prizes remaining. Just taking that energy to protect himself from any shenanigans with the gust. The Charizard EX will be knocked out. William down to one prize card. And it's all on Tord Reklev now. Can he return a knockout? Looking at that hand, we do not see a huge amount. And an energy off the top there. Ultra Ball Jirachi energy. I think the Luminion is gone. So no way to get a supporter with that. Yeah, there you go. There's the fist bump. Tord Reklev concedes game one after William taking initiative. All of those prizes, big knockouts from that Charles RDX, that maximum belt really shining to overcome that 330 HP Charles RDX. Just covering all the routes to victory there, William. Having the TM Devolution in the back pocket, ready to go just in case. Uh, if too many uh, rare candies were used, you might use that to try and really throw the board state down into the lowest form. But then on the other side, you've got the, the, the prime catcher. And in this matchup, that prime catcher, yes, it's useful to get up the early Vs on the bench to get a two prize knockout. But ultimately, it's that end game with the maximum belt, that end game with the TMD evolution, those powerful tool cards in William's deck that make this matchup so challenging for Tord. Yeah, as we do get a chance to recap this game one there. First prize initiation was from that knockout of that little Cleffer in the active spot before big knockouts from Tord put himself in Roxanne range. The barrel knockout was genius. Get rid of that draw engine, the one prize draw engine. Put yourself back onto those even prize cards. Yep, not activating all of those defiance bands, counter catches, and just activating the damage output that Charizard EX can ramp up on both sides of the board as he just starts swinging away and making it really difficult for Tord, taking out the little prize knockouts there. Just giving up two. And then Roxanne was big alongside that maximum. Yeah, we saw Tord had Roxanne in hand at one point, but with Pidgeot EX on board, it's not much use because uh, the Pidgeot EX will be able to find any card William needs in those final moments. And the Tord is worried about evolving up into Pidgeot EX because the maximum belt will put Pidgeot X in range quite early on. But as we see those prize cards come out, there's that Team Yells cheer we mentioned before being such a good card. And on the other side, Eerie. Eerie there, just hiding away in the prizes for the moment. William will probably have to be focusing on just getting his board state ready as we do see both players readied up for this 
game two here. William one game up against Tord Reklev in his Masters top four. William will be kicking us off first with that Pidgey in the active spot. Charmander coming down. And a couple of unique cards there. I think there's an Ultra Ball, Arvin, Rare Candy, Forest Seal Stone. There's a, there's a whole lot. A lot of good stuff. And for Tord, starting with the Manaphy in the active, not useful in this matchup, but we'll be able to find some other cards to get down. Just looking to go through with the Arvin, you know, the Buddy Buddy Poffin in combination with the Forest Seal Stone. A very good start if you have a V available. There we go, there's the Buddy Buddy Poffin. And Tord is trying to just check what prize cards there might be, making sure he's got everything sorted and looking to set up that stable board state. Having that barrel we mentioned was really important because it allows you to play a single prize support card on your bench, you know, the barrel drawing cards in those moments like the Roxanne. But quite early on, William targeted it down, knowing that that was so key to Tord when uh, the TM devolution threat. So what do you think Tord is going to have to do differently this time to set up a solid board state to work against William's build of Charizard EX? I think where he missed out on was trying to get up to that Pidgeot EX of his own, you know, being able to tutor or essentially search a deck for any card of your choice and then being able to utilize that fantastic ability, a fantastic utility of that Pidgeot EX. Even just the free retreat is fantastic to go into. And just stabilizing a little bit more. It was only ever one Charizard EX that Tord was able to get out. It did take four prizes, but when that's all you have, it's not quite enough, unfortunately. It looks like William's going to be getting both Pidgeot EX and Charizard into play. And that's a... Scary prospect, obviously going first as Charizard. The dream then is on your second turn to have everything you need in play, ready to go, especially in the mirror when they're protected at that stage as the damage output of Charizard the X is still too low. Um, so just gonna be deck checking here and making sure nothing too important in the prize cards. Uh, in particular, stuff like that maximum belt and the TM devolutions will be on the lookout. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, just a great sight to see the chaining of the rare candies into the um, Pidgeot EX, of course, into the Charizard EX, into the energies raining down. So much going on with this deck. It's such a lovely combo to see it in action. There's a rare candy there. Evolves up that Pidgeot EX. A wonderful card, quick search ability. Mentioned so often. And there's the Arvin as well to just continue picking further cards out of the deck that you can utilize going forward. Looks like that Rare Candy and that Maximil built being eyed up here. Well, Rare Candy, an important part of both these decks. Four of them played. William can comfortably evolve his Pokemon knowing that they won't be devolved. Tord has to be careful to utilize those Rare Candies. And as you can see, William using that quick search to find the Buddy Buddy Poffin and get a few more evolving basics down for future turns in case any of these do get knocked out. So we'll be putting a Charmander, or both, both uh, two different Charmanders, uh, the 60 HP and the 70 HP one. Uh, just uh, second guess himself again for that Pidgey, but six with the Charmander. It's really important here is that Tord only has one Charmander in play. Yeah, I mean, no ability to gust at this stage. That's no. where something like the Prime Catcher is that little bit more favored in those early turns, but for Tord, he's not gonna get a chance to utilize that Prime Catcher for early disruption. Yeah, that was such an important thing here, and you know, that's why we've seen that Maximum Belt already come into hand as a Forest Seal Stone. Pidgeot, despite only having two cards in hand, it looks like, doesn't really matter, because that Charizard's already up and ready and gonna be swinging away, it looks like. Burning Darkness, 180 damage on that Manaphy, taking the first prize of this game too. On you, Tord, what can you do here? Last game, William took the first prize as well into a single prizer. Happy to go ahead uh, because of the maximum belt. And we see that the barrel coming down. And it looks like we have the Pidgeot EX in hand. We don't have the rare candy there. Yeah, options available. That Forest Seal Stone will allow Tord to grab any card he would like. Does need to find a way to get one of those Pokemon Vs to utilize that, of course. I think there may have been an Ultra Ball in hand, as we do see the Buddy Buddy Poffin first. Of course, oh, sorry, not the Rare Candy. The Pidgeot EX is there. The only concern is now, he does have the Barrel to kind of draw up. It would mean having to get rid of some maybe vital resources. 
yeah, that hand was not looking ideal for an ultra ball. Just happier to get the single prizes that need to evolve onto the bench. Lots of Charmanders. We'll hopefully find a Charmeleon at some point to protect himself from the TM devolution a little bit more. Really hoping for a rare candy here. What does he get? Oh, just a nest ball, but that will be enough to get the Pokemon V in play if needed. Yeah, there's the Ultra Ball being utilized here. As you do see Tor just eyeing up one of those V Pokemon can grab not only the rare candy from the Forest Seal Stone, but with Luminium V, you can use Luminium Sign to grab such a key supporter card as well in this matchup. There comes the Arvin, there comes the rare candy, and the choice belt. No Vs on William's side. He has liabilities on the bench, but will evolve into that Pidgeot EX. Can put the Forest Seal Stone down onto the Luminium, and utilizing Forest Seal Stone and the Pidgeot EX's quick search can find that Charizard EX to set up that next attack. And as we suspected, that's exactly what comes down there. The rare candy into the Charizard EX, but that is now two rare candies used for Tord. So now William might be thinking, hmm, how can I integrate that TM devolution into my strategy? Yeah, for sure here. Does look like there's gonna be a swing away at your opponent's Charizard EX here from Tord. That's the key, isn't it? Get a little Charizard swing in. <laughs> it's very possible. I mean, just starting, you've already mentioned across the weekend that Heat Tackle, that 30 damage can start trying to chip away at things, but the Charizard EX is going to deal more damage. 100, no, sorry, 210 because of the prize taken so far. 180 base plus the 30 from one prize taken from William's side of the board. Now over to you, William, again. Not the biggest hands, but has access to quick search to just grab whatever you'd like. I mean, that TM devolution right now could be huge. Because that would mean two more rare candies would be needed for Tord. And that would be uh, another opportunity later on to use a TM devolution as there's two in the deck. Yeah, and don't forget, those two big Pokemon EX go back to hand as well. That also stops the barrel from effectively drawing as much value from that industrious incisors because he won't be able to instantly evolve them back up. Well, William cooked this list up and I'm sure is the most familiar with all of those different options and routes that you could take in this matchup. And TM Devolution was a card that was featured as a one-of and was enough to win the matchup a lot of times. And it seems that William's gonna be doing that also here with that Arvin taken Ooh. off of the quick search so now we just wait and see. What's the plan? Oh, he's eye he was eyeing it up, Mike. He was eyeing it up. It's definitely an option here. Here comes the Arvin. Is it that piece of the puzzle, that devolution, technical machine devolution? Such a fantastic card, a one-off use. Once you use it, devolve all your Pokemon, opponent's Pokemon, put them back into your opponent's hands. Does get discarded after that use. Only needs one colorless energy. And like I said, super impactful to this board because two rare candies gone. Pidgeot EX and Charizard EX would be going back to the hands. Industrials in sizes, simply less value here as well. And there we go. Super, super impactful. How can Tord react here? Top deck, Defiance bans does mean it's playable, but will only be able to draw up to three cards. There's two tool cards being placed down. One on the Pidgeot here. Needs to find that rare candy. Off of the Bibarrel. I mean, there are the Arvins in there. But then again, we mentioned if that rare candy is used, which he didn't find there, not much in that hand. As you mentioned, Pidgeot EX and Charizard EX were in the hand blocking that Industrious Incisors. And now we just look at a board where there's Charmanders and Pidgeys everywhere. Not what you're looking for here for Tord. William playing this matchup incredibly well, utilizing every one of those cards to full effect. And Tord really up against it here. Technical Machine Devolution. Utilized as a one of in the past to win the Charizard EX matchup. William, not happy with one, has put two in the list to try and win the matchup. So two rare candies have essentially been used up. Tord unable to find another rare candy. We'll just have to use a heat tackle with that defiance ban to start taking some damage onto that Charizard EX, but 
not enough to get it in range, and now it's back to William, who has set up to do exactly what he wants this turn with that Pidgeot EX. And that hand's always going to be clogged up for the moment with those two EX Pokemon, unless he finds a rare candy or finds a way out to a rare candy just to be able to use and utilize the value from the industrious incisors. Wow, this is uh, really tense here for Todd. I mean, his, like I said, his back's up against the wall. William here is take, gonna try and take advantage of this scenario. Just keep swinging away. It's a main aspect here. Quick search once again utilized. Lots of good cards in the hand. I see an Ultra Ball that was there as well. We'll want to try and start setting up those Charmanders on the bench to well, become big Charizard EXs. Game one, William didn't even use any of these TM devolutions. Now we're in game two. Use one early on, asking lots of questions of Tord, and just showing the power of tool cards currently in the format. You know, Lost Vacuum is a very good counter to it, but it's, it's not consistent enough to have lots of them in your deck, so we only ever really see one of them in any deck. And for, for Tord, he does have that Lost Vacuum, but you can't use it on the TM Devolution because it comes into play that turn. And the Maximum Belt typically gets played down and is used on that turn itself. So in this matchup, those tools are just powerful cards oh. that can be used whenever you want them. And another target down of that big barrel, Industrious Incisors, will be no more, just limiting what Tord can actually draw into. Really, really tough here now. William down to four prizes remaining. Tord, top deck, Charmeleon. Does just mean that it's just going to be an easy target to be picked off if he does evolve up one of his Charmanders. Could continue swinging away with that heat tackle. We'll get the knockout this turn, in fact. <laughs> Charmeleon there, evolving up one of the bench Charmanders. That is one way to get there. And it's just the heat tackle <laughs> knockout. The little the Charmander. Charmander. The Charmander that could. Two heat tackles with Defiance Band, able to get the knockout, leveling the prizes, but there's one board that looks a whole lot more stable, and that is Williams with the Pidgeot EX in play, ready to go. And anything he needs can be found from the deck. He is able to evolve this next Charizard at will, based off of that hand. It's just then, what else do you want to do? What's really big, Mike, and I think we may have just clocked it from the prizes there. I think Tord picked up one of those rare candies that was prized. So there's, there's a world, there's a way where Tord could find a comeback here. But, you know, we've already mentioned there's double TM devolution available on, on William's side. He's going to have to lean into that Charmeleon where possible, but I'm sure William's going to be looking at that with glaring eyes. Well, from William's point of view, he knows there's a Charizard EX in Tord's hand. So he's going to be worried about that Charmeleon that's just come down. And so he's going to be thinking about maybe gusting it up. But he also has an Eerie in his hand. So is he going to be thinking, I gust up the Charmeleon to knock it out, to uh, take away Tord's ability to evolve here? But then that also leaves the Defiance Band in play, which with a one prize knockout would put Tord in range of knocking out the Pidgeot EX. So this turn, <laughs> if William chooses incorrectly based off of the target that he goes for here, whether it's the Charmeleon or the Charmander, or whether it's the hand with that Eerie, quickly dictate how Tord gets out of it. You'd have to have an incredible read to play Eerie here, I think. Knowing Tord hasn't utilized another rare candy as of yet, you know, surely would have tried to evolve up into a Charizard EX as we do see the Ultra Ball away of the Eerie, so not an option here. Which would you go for if you were, if you were William? Charmander with Defiance Ban or Charmeleon? I think you just still have to limit what Tord has access to, and that Charmeleon represents an easy way to evolve up to a Charizard EX. But, you know, there's so many different options here. Star Alchemy popped with that Luminum V on the board, looking to grab his own Charizard EX once again and set up two of them, or the second one, I should say. Just has to swing away and make sure he's prepped and ready or whatever Tord can throw at him going forward. Both players with six fire energy in their deck, so something they have to manage well. And uh, I think at this moment, a super rod will be utilized by William just to get some energy back in. Uh, there it is. Super rod, that Charles RDX and two fires are going back into the deck. Of course, if he does just rare candy up, one of those Charmanders will be grabbing those fire energies. 
Back out once again. There's the red candy. There's Infernal Rain, Charles RDX hitting the field. At least one decided off that Infernal Rain. And that's enough for the moment, at least. So based off of the boss's orders from that Luminion, I think we're going to be seeing the Charmeleon targeted right now. That Charmeleon added into the Charizard lists thanks to that Flare Veil ability. Prevents all effects of attacks used by your opponent's Pokemon done to this Pokemon. So a great way to avoid being devolved. But it will be the Luminion targeted instead. William looking for that prize race. This whole time we were asking Charmander or Charmeleon, and William said fish. <laughs> and there we go. Two prizes further taken. Now William in a position where he just needs one massive knockout to get through to that Masters final on Championship Sunday. Todd, it's on you maybe to try and turn this back all around. William has taken four prizes. Roxanne is live, but Pidgeot being in play does kind of put a stop to that. Yeah, in this turn, Todd really has to knock out a Pidgeot, disrupt the hand, find a way to get the Charles Island play, which we know is in hand now. Um, so a lot is being required. And I mean, you could get the rare candy onto the Pidgeot, but then you don't get the, the evolution of the Charizard with the Defiance Bam, which isn't useful down the line. I mean, this is a tough situation to be for Tord, but William just recognizing that if a Charizard EX takes a knockout of this stage with that maximum belt, he's in a strong position to be able to get the return KO. Yeah, there's one more rare candy left in deck, of course. He, Tord is currently iron up that. Radiant Charizard can keep his board just at one prizes here, which means William is unable to win the next turn. Very good. Another route to victory. Another way to maybe I mean, take out the fish of his own um, to bring himself down to two prizes and just single prizes on the board. And then William has to make that vital decision whether to take another knockout because then you're just activating all of the damage maximum damage that's available, but here's the red candy for the Pidgeot. And the Charizard comes down into play as well. Infernal Rain landing on the full board. Looks like Tord is eyeing up that rocks Anne. Oh, wow, so this turn, I think if this Roxanne can find the prime catcher or a counter catcher, then it will be possible to get that Pidgeot EX into the active and disrupt completely. Yeah, but no hands, Roxanne, there from Tord. This is big. Shuffle draw six for Tord Reklev. Shuffle draw two for William Azevedo. This is going to be such a vital two cards. Three cards with your actual draw as well. That could be coming down here from William's side of the board. Should William have maybe put that maximum belt in play? But then I guess you would just knock out the Charizard in that situation. I mean, that maximum belt was in hand, ready to go. But if you put it in play, it can be lost vacuumed away. But it might have potentially set up a, a checkmate board state. But the lost vacuum did come off of that Roxanne. But there's no prime catcher there. Yeah, no catcher gusting effect available for Tord Reklev. Charmander just being still in the active spot is a bit of a pivot here with that one energy attached to it. But what can Tor do? William will have access to everything in the deck because of Quick Search. Tor's only taken two prizes after all. Looks like another heat tackle for 30. Just one, to, one damage to itself. Wow, so for Tor, with four prize cards taken, that Burning Darkness will be doing 240 damage with a maximum belt. That Pidgeot EX is in range, but trusting enough that the Roxanne put William out of range of the dream combo pieces of maximum belt and gust effect here. And so William just having to think a little bit. What do you do in this moment? You've got a Roxanne yourself, but it's not activated. Not quite, and it's just that Iono, especially when you know the Roxanne could be activated in due course. Do you just hold the hands, maybe show no strength here? But here comes the Pidgeot EX. Quick search once again. All these options available. Power, Power pad, 
I guess, trying to get the boss back, maybe? Yeah, trying to put some good supporters back into the deck and utilize boss's orders once again. I mean, this oh, is... Uh, so many decisions here, so much real thinking involved between the two Charizard EX players here. The intricacy of this matchup is really being shown here, especially as both of them have unique ways to deal with the other's deck. I think William, the tool approach with the maximum belt and the TM devolution, and then for Tord being able to combine that prime catcher with a disruption turn, both of them able to have these big, powerful turns that swing it back in their favor, and frequently, those powerful turns come when you're behind, and that's what we just saw there from Tord. Going down and behind was allowed to use that Roxanne to set up a powerful board state for himself and really disrupt William. Yeah, that power pad now utilized, putting some vital resources back into the deck, which can always be tutored out for the moment. Just deciding whether to attach that energy, of course, to that Charmeleon on the bench right now. Don't think it hurts too much to do so, but just kind of second guessing himself because energies can sometimes be really difficult to come by if you don't find your Charizard EXs. There's the attachment. Iono putting that Roxanne that he did have in hand back to the bottom of the deck and reducing the number of cards that Tord has in his. Well, Tord now has that Pidgeot EX established, so that will help in this next turn. And with that 30 damage from the Heat Tackle onto the Charizard, that puts it in range. And this turn has now become a whole lot more interesting as William is trying to force his way back into the game despite taking that early lead and doing so much to make it hard for Tord with that TM devolution earlier on. Yeah, with that Iono, William not having too many cards in hand. If he does decide to play it, he does have that buddy buddy Poffin that he's just utilized as well. Just get cards out of the deck. <laughs> Both of them just acknowledging the Cleffer. Uh, great card. I'm sure they've, they've had a lot of success with that Cleffer. I think the free retreating aspect of the Cleffer is huge. As William goes down to one prize card remaining and it's now all on toward. What can you do in these final stages to take the victory despite being down so many prize cards? So, from that I know did pick up the Prime Catcher, can limit the Pidgeot EX that's on William's side of the board right now as well. Does need to try and find a, another disruption card that I don't know that was played by William. Maybe it's got already in hand. Maybe something doesn't, he doesn't have to worry about. This is really tough. As you know that if you use a disruption card, your opponent's going to have very few cards in hand. But sometimes they... They only need one card, right? And in this situation, the maximum belt is the only card William needs. So can you fully rely on just disruption? Do you need to take a knockout on a big attacker? I think you really have to focus on that Pidgeot EX and take it away. But if you knock out the Charizard, then the Pidgeot EX has to both find a Charizard and a maximum belt. So both lines have their feasibilities. And it's now on tour to decide whether the Prime Catcher needs to be used at this moment. Yeah, or a Gust, just to maybe take out that little Charmander with 40 HP remaining as well. Still needs an energy on that Charmeleon, maybe. That's true. So there's, there's a couple of different directions. You know, I, it's finding out which direction gives toward the maximum percentage chance of winning this match here. Do you gust the Pidgeot EX and then Iono and push your opponent closer, potentially, to that boss that he did just recover back into the deck? Because you then have already an attacker. Oh, wow, just going to be using the Iono. So, Straight away, relying on disruption, kept the counter catcher and prime catcher in deck. Giving William only access to one card plus that top deck if he does take the knockout on the Charizard EX on the active spot here. That's the direction Tord has. Looked like he's going down. He could always still quick search for a card. That's true. It was in the hand before, but I guess wanted to see what's on the other side of that I know. We'll be using that Pidgeot EX to get it. Grass isn't always greener. And I guess it also puts the counter catcher back up towards the top of the deck. Yeah, for sure. So options here right now for Tords. My what, what's that one card in William's hand right now? Come Tords, on, William. Show Tords, us. <laughs> I think Tords just still deciding which direction to go down. Like I said, it's all about those small percentages. 
If Tor takes out the Charizard EX, William has access to Quick Search. Maybe he could play a supporter of some sort to be able to pick up the right pieces alongside a Gust. We're not really too sure. It's only the boss's orders that's available. I mean, or that's it. If that one card William gets, or the, from the two cards William gets, one of them is a boss's orders, then he would be able to get the knockout with that Charizard EX and goes for the Pidgeot EX, takes the knockout, trusts the disruption. What will William get in this final turn here of our first semi-final? What is it? <laughs> Both players praying, it looks like. Cleffer with a free retreater. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it wasn't the card needed for William. Not quite yet. Tord can quick search for the counter catcher. Cleffer grasping draw there. Counter catcher now still live, of course. Quick search here. Tord smirking to himself. He's found the route, hits boss as well. So many different ways of doing so. Leveling up the series here in the Masters top four. 1 1 in this Charizard mirror match. Disruption is the key. And Tord not only did it once, did it twice, whilst also knocking out that Pidgeot EX. And you can see how intricate this matchup is, how smart these players have to be to navigate their way through those mid turns. And it's all about those prize cards. You want to take prize cards to win the game, but you don't want to take prize cards to give the opponent access to those higher damage outputs for the big one hit KOs. And we'll be going to game three, <laughs> the relief after seeing no boss's orders there. Just a few replays. I mean, it's been a grueling match here. Let's remind ourselves. What's a long game too, it felt like. I mean, different angles were played here where we had the TM devolution, we had knockouts, we just had the barrel taken down once again. It's never really seen much of the much of the light of day here in this matchup. It has to, it has <laughs> to be there though. <laughs> You'd rather they took the barrel than any of your other uh, uh, cards on board. I mean, you need it there for that secondary support card. I mean, Pidgeot EX is great, but it is dangerous when the maximum belt is in William's deck. Yeah, that Charmander with the with Defiance belt, maybe Defiance ban, sorry, maybe the MVP is it just keeps punching through that Charizard EX for a two prize knockout there. How about that heat tackle twice in a row with a Defiance ban to take out the knockout? Yeah, incredible. And then just being able to effectively make the right decision here. Remember, I had two options. Could take out the Charizard EX in the active spot, leaving the Pidgeot EX, or leaving the grand attack of Williams and towards deck in play and taking out that support Pokemon. Yeah, at the end there, the, the one and two card hands for William. Not quite able to find either the maximum belt or a boss's orders or whatever it was. As we go into our game three, both of them prizing the Charmeleon and for towards some important support Pokemon there in the prize cards and the Forest Seal Stone. So gonna maybe struggle to get set up. It all depends on that first hand. On the other side, William, a few energy, two of the six energy prize there. Game three, everyone of this Masters top four between Tord Reckleff and William Azevedo. William kicking us off once again, but now with that Luminium V in the active spot. But yes, those prizes were tough for Tord. If you're gonna be impacted by TM devolutions, if you're gonna be impacted by draw power that may now no longer be available to yourself because that Cleffer is an easy target from Buddy Buddy Poffin, it's gonna to be tough here. And that big barrel engine as well, it's just the one one line. It's just a bit of a safety net and it's just not gonna be available at least at this point. Well, early days here in the matchup, as we know, it doesn't really start ramping up until the Charizard EX and the Pidgeot EX are in range of a Burning Darkness. And the Luminion V, despite being a two prize Pokemon, sometimes Rotom V and Luminion V, you don't mind your opponent's Charizard EX deck taking out one of those two prizes as it just increases your damage output. And as we saw in that last game, William went ahead in the prize race quite significantly, but still ended up losing towards the end as the disruption and ramped up damage was too much to deal with, as it will be the Buddy Buddy Poffin for both sides helping to set up the board. A lot of good cards there in Tord's hand, a lot of Pokemon that you could be bringing out. That Buddy Buddy Poffin being played now, I'm sure he's gonna be looking for that Cleffer, but little does he know until he does his price checking, it's not gonna be available this time round. But has Charmaders, has other Pidgeys available, doesn't 
isn't able to grab the barrel or Bidoof, sorry, either. So the two usual targets we've seen Tord sort of go for, it's going to be a bit limited here. Just kind of going to have to go through the usual route of Charmanders and Pidgeots. Or oh, Pidgey, sorry. This is what separates those best players. Neither of them having the ideal start here. Luminion V, one of the worst starters you could have as it has a coming into play effect with that Luminous Sign. And it's a two prize liability on the board. And for Tord, some of those important Buddy Buddy Boffin targets not available. But that's where you have to change the route to victory. Every game between these players would be so different if they repeated this 10 times over. But that's what makes them great, is working out based off the hand they have, the board, what your opponents put in play, what's in your prize cards, how best to navigate this matchup. Yeah, it looks like Tor's just eyeing up that Luminion V from that Ultra Ball as well, knowing he doesn't have access to some of the additional support Pokemon there. Plays the full lineup of support Pokemon. He has had that Rotom V somewhere as well, hiding in the deck. Grabs an Iono from Luminous Sign. Of course, doesn't have access to that Forest Seal Stone. Unfortunately, as well, just another one of those pieces of the puzzle that would help effectively quick search very early on to just get that live as soon as possible. Yeah, well, there we go, Luminion V. One of the last remaining support V Pokemon that we have now, post-rotation. Great way to find a supporter. Only 170 HP, though, so you do have to be careful when you put it into play, as it can be easily knocked out, and that lightning weakness we've seen throughout the tournament has been key with Iron Hands everywhere. But both these players have got past the Iron Hands as there's no longer any of those remaining, and they are here in a situation where Illuminion is more important in play than it is out of play as that Luminous Sign getting the supporters at the right <laughs> moments. And speaking of out of play, Luminion V will be removed from play with that collapsed stadium. So now we see Tord with a single prize board state and a disrupted opponent. Yeah, both players drawing the next six cards. Iono shuffling your hand and putting it to the bottom of the deck and then drawing a number of prizes remaining, of course. But yes, removing his own Luminion V out of play, had an empty hand as well, so getting full value from this Iono. Full squads out. Three Heat Tackle Charmanders and two of those Pidgey. And from William's side, not looking too strong either at the moment. Has nestful space just for one more additional Pokemon. Currently, until a stadium replaces that collapsed one. Oh, just realizing the collapsed stadium was there. Wanted to play another nest ball. Yeah, that's, that's the current worry here. Does have lost vacuum in hand as well. Maybe can remove one of those TM devolutions for the time being. You've already mentioned he does play two of them. Is that an option to try and get the Cleffer down so that you can start drawing cards? Has Iono as well. Ooh, a couple of tough choices here. Usually doesn't want to waste some of those lost vacuums. But there you go. Radiant Charizard hitting the lost zone alongside that Collapse Stadium. As we do see now, the second nest ball for that Cleffer. Oh, I've, I've never seen a card make Tord happier than that Cleffer going down right there. I think one of those cards, when it first came out, people recognized the power of it. You know, any free retreat is great. And with a zero energy attack cost, to be able to draw your hand up to seven, very powerful effect. And so we'll be just sat there, ready to be utilized, if possible, maybe retreating that Luminium with an energy. And that will be a way to help set up. And unlike something like Rotom V, which would be put into play and then draw three cards and be stuck on that bench, Cleffer could be used as a, a retreater, can be a single prize option to do that. So a much safer option when you've already got Luminion in play. Yeah, it is very much a great card to have here. And both players recognizing, utilizing Buddy Buddy Poffins now instead of Battle VIP Pass, where you'd use it to typically get things like that Rotom V you've highlighted. Just being able to be searchable with a card you're gonna use multiple of anyway, just simply means it's a, it's a great option because you're getting so much utility out of it. Yeah, and um, we've seen some of the Charizard list playing two Rotom V, right? And that was because it was so important in those early turns. But if you've got Rotom V, Luminion V, and Cleffer, you've got those three options to draw cards. As we see the grasping draw, taking that hand up to seven. Yeah, that hand was a Charizard EX, Pidgeot EX, and the technical 
machine devolution and then drawing up to four more cards. So a rare candy. I mean, you could use Clefer to devolve some of those pesky Pokemon on the other side of the board. As we do see a rare candy already utilized toward ironing up another rare candy. Will we see a repeat? It's a couple of turns of game two here just because of what William has in hand and that's what is available to him. We've got to still take note of the fact that there were two energy prize for William. One has been discarded to retreat that Luminion. And so if you attach one to the Cleffer for TM Devolution, you start to think, where, where is the remaining energy? Is it possible to get it into play with the Charizard as well? So the resource here is so important. All of these resources, the six energy count in Charizard, whilst being a little bit tight, it does allow you to have more space for those other cards. Remember where Tord had access to that Charmeleon last time. There won't be any this time because it's in those prizes, hiding away for the moment. So if those rare candies are effectively null and void from a technical machine devolution, there's not an easy way for Tord to get back up to a Charizard EX. Yeah, Charmeleon prize for both players. So mm -hmm. oh, this is fascinating how these prize cars have, have affected this game. and. You know, we're fortunate here as the viewers to know the, the challenges they're both facing in terms of their setup. But from their point of view, they have no idea what the opponent has prized. Yeah, big Iono. He didn't know William has access to all of those resources, of course. But reducing it from seven down to six is still a disruption that's still very helpful in this type of matchup here. Well, especially when you see them hold cards. You're thinking they must have something good there. As for Tord right now, going too far ahead puts William in range with the maximum belt, but he's hopefully going to try and take some knockouts here whilst disrupting over and over again. Mm -hmm. but do you want to go far ahead in this matchup? That's always it's, the question. That's, that's the game that we have to play here. We do see that Prime Catcher utilized on that Luminium V, limiting what William could do with his own Collapse Stadium. Let's take those two prizes now. It keeps... The Charizard EX continuing to be out of range, of course. That Pidgeot EX also, for the time being, out of range, unless you find that incredible, powerful tool card. And this is where those prize cards are really key. You know, Clap Stadium, I think, in the prizes for William. For Tord, has some really important prize cards he wants to take, mm -hmm. like that Charmeleon. Maybe uh, the, uh, the Cleffer for himself at some point in the future. I doubt it's past that stage, but yep. the Bidoof to set up the Bibarrel. Uh, all those cards are really important. And the Charmeleon not going to be taken for a little while here. So Tord is just trying to work out and navigate these turns without it. And that's where that TMD Evolution could come in as a huge card for William if he's able to get it. But that Iono seemed to have disrupted him into a tough old hand. Yeah, not the easiest of choices here from William. Double checking his opponent's resources, of course. You know, resource management key in any game of the Pokemon trading card game, not just your own. You need to keep an eye on your opponent's resources. He's already eyeing up, I'm sure, those two rare candies that have been utilized to evolve up the Pidgey and the Charmander on Tord's side already. That Buddy Buddy Poffin grabbing that Charmander, going wide once again, making sure he has access to his Pokemon. They have to utilize, once again, that grasping draw. Can't quite see too many cards he can utilize here. Counter catcher, choosing the Pidgey. Has another one in hand for a future turn. Draws two. Fire energy and a technical machine devolution. That's one way to keep going, but this board state isn't yet the greatest from William's side. I mean, that's hit here, right? Tord can start taking knockouts, but by only able to put one Charizard X in play uh, at the risk of TMD Evolution completely disrupting his board, he can't chain attackers as well as you'd want to, maybe using that Radiant Charizard at some point in the future, but very scared at that big swing turn where the, the Charizard X does get disrupted and the Ionos that we saw be such a key part of those early turns in, in hand disruption might be looked to be returned with that amazing inclusion from Tord of the team yells cheer. Yeah, the fantastic cards usually seen in control archetypes. One of the ones he overcome was Burt Walters' Pidgeot control, um, or even sometimes seen, well, should be seen in the Snorlax control list as well, but team yells cheer, being able to shuffle up 
any combination of Pokemon and supporters cards, except Team Yell's Cheer, of course, from your disco pile into your deck. Iron up the Iono, iron up that Luminion and V, and just kind of say, well, I need those resources back just to keep going and keep impacting my opponent here. And that's where those early turns, if you are ahead, you have a few options to start stabilizing the board. That Team Yell's Cheer, a key card at this moment whilst Tord might just continue to take knockouts or may even not be able to move that Pidgey out of the active. We haven't seen what's possible as the Pidgeot EX was used to grab that Team Yell's Cheer. So Tord does have an energy there. We'll get that Bidoof down. So now just looking to stabilize and perhaps just continue these attacks. Yeah, it's one of those things where we saw in the game two where we saw a lot of single prizes take. This is where it kind of causes that odd prizing being taken, so now free taken from Tord, puts him in range of that Roxanne as well. The hand is full of rare candies. If he just does hit an Ultra Ball, Pidgeot EX. Oh, there we go. That's a Charizard EX here, so he can start building out his board himself. Is this turn going to be the turn we go for the TMD Evolution and just leave it as a single prize board state? You know, you've got to navigate your way back out of this. And that's what. I think that's the decision that William's having to consider now. Rare Candy, which Charmander? The shiny one from Paldean Fates. Not Leaving many energy in the deck, just the two. Leaving the heat tackles available, we saw how impactful those were in the last game. Especially with the maximum belt available. Yep, can actually deal 80 damage. <laughs> For one energy. Imagine that. 10 damage to itself. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's something that typically you don't have to worry about too much. But here's the energy attachment retreat into the Charizard EX. I mean, taking a swing at this first before using TM Devolution later would mean he takes some prizes as well. There's the gust up with the free prizes taken. 90 additional damage on top of that. 180 base. It's a knockout on that Pidgeot EX. Taking two prizes here with that maximum belt could be really impactful because now Tord is unable to just simply take any card out of his deck as he would like. Okay, well, this is the stage where that Pidgeot EX being removed, what can Tord's deck do to stabilize? We've got the Bidoof down now, but no Barrel, So maybe relying a little bit on those top decks and it could be a big swing turn here for William. That maximum belt being the ace spec of choice for William where Tord has opted for the prime catcher in these big moments here you can see how powerful that maximum belt is into the mirror will it be enough to hold william in the lead and start taking more knockouts down the line the scary aspect now is toward has to make that vital decision on whether to utilize another rare candy and put it towards another pidgeot ex once again but that's maybe another way of sort of baiting that potential TM evolution or what William is trying to get out of Tord here. And we did see there was a lost vacuum in Tord's hand. So we'll be able to remove that maximum belt and make it no longer a threat going forward. So that's a huge opportunity now to change the tide of those final turns and keep the Charizard EX out of range. But as you mentioned, TM devolution would then be the worry. Uh, so Tord now having to navigate the game through a, a maximum beltless Charizard EX that is still pretty hard to knock out. Yeah, there's so many swings and roundabouts that we're going to face here. Babaro Industrials and Sizes as a fire energy and the Pidgeot EX does have rare candy in hand, but is this the moment, Tord? Or do you hold and just wait? Oh, risky business. And I guess at this stage, that maximum belt is not something too much to worry about as if it were to take a swing at the Charizard EX, it would just be 10 damage short. Does have Ultra Ball now in hand, William, so has access to his own Pidgeot EX, finally. I think what Tord is trying to set up here is that single prize board state. Perhaps next turn, putting the Radiant Charizard into play to either finish off the Charizard itself or be able to swing into the Pidgeot EX with a uh, prime catcher, maybe using that to get it up and then using the Defiance Band to hit that extra 30 damage. Yeah, I think then just having any an easy attack on any one of those bench Pokemon. I mean, he's already Team Yelschid, some of those vital pieces back as well. 
where he needs to. This is going to be some really vital turns here between both players. Oh, it's really on a nice edge. And I hope you guys at home and here at this venue are enjoying this as much as we are because it is tense in this top four match. I mean, when we look at mirrors, you rarely see this much difference in their compositions with Tord being very clever, putting that big barrel line, the 1-1 one, one barrel, barrel line just to support the Pidgeot EX when it does get taken out of play. And on the other side, we've got the TM Devolution strategy alongside Eerie, and we've got different A specs in both decks. So a completely unique matchup compared to the Charizard EX they'll be playing before. And at this stage, Tord is trying to manipulate those prize cards by only taking the three, keeping that Charizard EX in the active out of range. And this is so vital here. Quick search now, following that Ultra Ball that Roxanne has been sort of semi-placed to the front of that deck. Looks like it's an easy choice. Tord will be impacted from with some disruption on this turn given two cards to play with, plus the additional draw. But will William combo this with ATM Devolution as well? Oh yeah, that's an interesting take. And that's perhaps why Tor didn't want to get rid of that maximum belt. Because had he, had he removed the maximum belt with the lost vacuum, then it would have opened up that active Charizard to be able to utilize the technical machine Devolution. But by leaving the maximum belt there, it means that active Charizard with energy on couldn't do it. And that forces more resources out of William. Yeah, so he has attached it to that Pidgey, that Call for Family. 50 HP Pidgey, not really too threatening, other than this energy attachment to it with that TM Devolution as well, where you devolve each of your opponents. Evolve Pokemon by putting the highest stage evolution card on it into your opponent's hand. And that's where you're going to start to see some of those cards clog up what Tord could be working with. Once again, actually, it happened in game two, remember, but Tord found a way out of it. We mentioned early on in this game, the energy counts being a big factor. They were taken off the prize cards for William. So now has access to all six of those. And there we go. Look at that hand. <laughs> two rare candies and the Charizard. So we'll be able to find those energy needed. And so retreating into the Pidgey would be an option now. Can also just take a swing into the active Charizard, leaving it on those that 10 HP, but knows that Tord on the other side has ways to reset that damage with the Professor Turo scenario. So these final turns are going to be tough to navigate for both sides. Yeah, what initially looked like a really strong turn for Tord Reklev here. That Ultra Ball really opened up everything that's available for William's side just by having that Pidgeot EX. As we do see the hard retreat, that Pidgey Sent forward with Technical Machine, Devolution activated, and that attack really just putting all of those highest evolution cards back into Tord's hand. Two rare candies gone. What do we have? What are we working with? There's an Arvin. Can My grab goodness. one of those other rare candies that are still in the deck. There's still ways to get back into this game and stay ahead. We've got the Radiant Charizard as well now. That's a great option as an attacker. The barrel can go straight down, but the Arvin, important to tutor out any card you need, whether it's an item or a tool. All of them so powerful in this deck, and Tord opting to be barrel first here, it seems, so that you can see if he gets any of those important cards naturally off the draw. Roxanne and two Arvins now in hand. So can go straight back into the Charizard EX. Should he wish to do so, of course, that previous Pidgeot EX was KO'd on a previous turn. That's why William is currently down to four prizes remaining, toward down to three, and that's why that Roxanne was so impactful, or what initially was so impactful. As Choice Belt and the Rare Candy is selected, one final Rare Candy left in deck. Charmeleon, I think, is still hiding in those prizes. Choice Belt, a useful just discard fodder. And there's the Pidgeot. Is can attack with the Radiant Charizard here, so keeping that other rare candy potentially. But if they use both rare candies now, that will mean another TM Devolution would completely take out all of the rare candies from play. And it looks like that Pidgeot is going to be searching out for the other rare candy. 
looking to evolve another Charizard. And it will be done just there as we see all rare candies from Tord being used. One TMD Evolution from William being used. And there is another one available, that Radiant Charizard as an option towards the end game. Yeah, one of those really useful cards to try and swing away at William's side of the board by taking one additional prize. If there's a world where Tor can navigate that William takes just one prize, can force a really awkward scenario where a Defiance Band could stretch for the KO on something like that Pidgeot EX on William's side of the board. And even that Charizard EX, which has damage on it, will be in range of the Radiant Charizard. So just setting up this end game, still no Charmeleon, but uh, we'll hopefully be able to take a final knockout later on. But at this stage, William might just look to devolve rather than anything else. But then that would mean just one prize is in play. So eventually, it would be for Tord to be able to take a knockout with the Radiant Charizard. Yeah, very vital couple of turns here. Does have boss in hand. There's an option to maybe target something different. Arvin being played now. Is that TM Devolution still in the deck? There it is, right at the bottom. <laughs> Straight away, there's your question answered. Straight away, Super Rod going to be needed. Lots of energy has been discarded. So we'll have to try and find a way to get them back. That Super Rod, look, you can see there, straight away. Three energy needed as that retreat from the Charizard took two energy out of play. The Pidgey in the active spot that was used for the technical machine devolution was knocked out. So three energy was taken away last turn. So that Super Rod required. And we've got the Pidgeot EX to be able to get it out of the deck if needed and a, Radiant, a Charizard Evolution too. So it does potentially come down to whether Tor can just draw into something like that boss or a gusting effect card, which is not counter catcher of course, because he's ahead on prizes right now, and just swing away with potentially a Char Radiant Charizard. But at the moment, Excited Heart only allowing two, a reduction of two colorless energies for the attack cost. For those of you who've just tuned in, we are here at EUIC in the top four. This is the first of our semi-finals. We'll be watching the other semi-final in just a moment uh, with Asaya Bradner and Alessandro. You know his surname very well. I, I love the way you pronounce it. Go for it. Premiscoli. Oh, yeah, that, that is <laughs> prime Italian name right there. They'll be playing off after this in the other semi-final. Meanwhile, we're having this Charizard mirror here between Tord Reklev and William Azevedo as that second technical machine devolution is used. Infrequently seen in Charizard EX, a double TM devolution. And on this occasion, Tord now left with no rare candies. And there we go, it's just a fist bump. I guess it's just, we'll get confirmation of exactly what's happened between the two players here as time has gone down. We're just gonna get confirmation, but it looks like Williams just signed a slip. It's just single prizes on the board. And is that Tor, Tor Reklev, Reklev with a circle on the winner's side? What a anticlimactic <laughs> finish there. Time has been cool. It's something we haven't really been tracking too much of. But Williams so close with a second TM devolution there. Just, just not able. Just so close. Once again, another top four finish. Wow, Tord Reklev. With the victory in the final moments, just getting far enough ahead in that last game and having that Radiant Charizard available towards the end game if needed for a knockout. Recognizing there wasn't enough turns as that is our result here. I mean, my goodness, we saw the Charizard EX intricacy there. Every game completely unique. And consequently, Tord Reklev showing that class in those final moments setting up a very stable board state, recognizing how to use those rare candies. But that is a unique take on the mirror match there. Never seen it quite like it. No, this is a, this is a first for both of us to kind of see. I mean, we usually see Charizard EX just swinging into one another. We've seen Charmander swinging in. We've seen Pidgeys devolving the opponent's board state. Cleffer. Cleffer drawing cards. Who needs Rotom V in this scenario? But we get a chance to replay and recap this incredible 75 minutes of Charizard mirror match here. Two of the greatest brains in our game as well, navigating it. And it was wonderful to see how they saw the intricacy of the matchup, recognizing the different cards within both decks that can punish them if they ever make a mistake. 
So for Todd, not using too many rare candies in case of William's devolutions and vice versa. So both of them at this stage were showing the, the reason why they included those cards. But in the end, it was Todd who came out on top with a slightly stronger start in game three. Yeah, kudos to both players here, making it to the Masters top four of this incredible EUIC for 2024 so far. William just falling a little bit short, it feels like once again, but that game one really sort of taking command as we see the boss's orders for some incredible important prizes are just impacting towards board there. And throughout the game, whenever we knew a gust effect was coming through, it was very hard to know which thing they were going to gust up from the bench. And there was one occasion where the uh, the option was seeming like it was going to be Charmander or Charmedian, and they said it was the Luminion. And just the, the smart navigation of the prizing from both players to recognize which target was the best target. And in the end, it did just come down to those small little inefficiencies early on in the setup. The mid game, not quite having the right cards in play that you needed once the disruption came through. Whatever it was, both players were trying to think through every scenario and did so, so well to make it hard for their opponent. Yeah, toward in this game too, finding a different direction than the usual to handle the TM devolutions, of course. Had his hand clogged up with that initial one there and it was a real struggle to just find those pieces once again, but there was an extra turn which he had to kind of just wait before bringing up and sort of taking the right knockouts there because Bibarrel got taken out twice, games one and game two. And then the little Charmander that could with the Defiance band on, ready to take those big knockouts. <laughs> there it was, Charmander, hitting for the second 60 damage in a row to na nail that Charizard EX and finish it off. And that's where those, those heat tackles are so key in the matchup. And Luminion V, frequently used to get the right support at the right time, but also left in play many a time to be an easy target. And this was the greatest bit here in this game too, of course. Having set up a single prize board state, William could only take one additional prize, forcing Charizard EX to be able to deal the enough damage to knock out William's own Charizard if he chose to do so. And it was that decision making, whether to take out the Pidgeot EX or the attacker following that Roxanne. And that's where Tor was able to take game two. And game three, I mean, I don't think we knew anything of what was to be expected. All of these support Pokemon prize, Forest Silstone, Charmeleon in the top there, just to try and prevent some of that TM devolution. But you know what? Tor's found a way. All four rare candies used, all four rare candies gone in this game. And early on, Tord using those Iron O's to disrupt the hand and gained a few turns off the back of it. Took a two fries with the Luminium V and then was able to take out this Cleffer with the Charizard EX whilst constantly disrupting William. Eventually, William found a way out and was able to attack with that Charizard EX using the maximum belt to increase the damage output. Pidgeot EX was taken out and then at that point, Tord was just trying to go as far ahead and stay ahead. Yeah, this was 75 minutes of highlights that we're recapping here as well. Incredible matchup between two incredible players. I mean, just seeing Pidgey just devolve everything, cause chaos um, across the board there. It's just incredible to watch how Tor was navigating through the matchup. And having used the final two rare candies on this particular turn, maybe he didn't realize there would be two. Yeah, I mean, you, you hear your opponent's got technical machine devolution. You do not expect it to be in a two count. Previously, before the rotation, it was just in there as a one count. Now, it's there as a two count. Maybe we'll see that happen more often. Maybe we'll see the Barrel combined with the Pidgeot EX. But ultimately, it was Tord who made it all the way to our EUIC final tomorrow. Yeah. And again, massive congratulations to William. Another IC top four at the biggest tournament outside of Japan. And it's just fallen that little bit short. If I recall correctly, we said at the beginning of that match, the last time William made a top four, it was that same event that Tord went on to win in the final. So Correct. maybe there's something kind of happened here. Maybe you're going to have a repeat of history. I mean, Tord, yeah, he makes, him, makes his way into yet another final. I mean, 